The topic for this week is learning. Learning is one of the most important branches of study within psychology because learning affects so much of our day-to-day -day functioning. Consider for a moment as we begin this unit, what would your life be like if you could not learn? Chances are if you think about this for a few minutes, you'll realize that learning is such an essential piece of your day-to-day -day functioning that if you were unable to learn new material, you would be pretty much stuck in the same routine over and over without the capability of expanding repertoire of behaviors, doing new things, enjoying new experiences. Sometimes it's possible for a person to have an illness and have part of their brain injured such that they cannot learn new information. This was the case with a British orchestra conductor by the name of Clive Waring who had an illness and was unable to form new memories after the illness due to brain damage. His life is spent now in a nursing home and he's unable to learn new material and in fact he's unable to remember even things that happened moments before. So learning is a critical piece of who we are and what we do. Next slide. Have you ever tried to teach an animal a trick? For example, have you ever tried to teach your dog how to roll over or to sit up or fetch a newspaper? If you have, the only way that you know that the animal has learned something is if their behavior has changed. Teachers face the same dilemma every day in the classroom. How do they know if their students have learned something? Well, if they couldn't answer a test question before, but now they can answer the test question, that change in behavior gives some indication that they've learned. Psychologists define learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior due to experience. Now, it's possible for us to have change in behavior that's not due to our experiences. For example, when a child goes through puberty, he may become more interested in members of the opposite sex. This is not necessarily due to life experiences, but rather due to hormonal changes in the body. So we would say that the interest in the opposite sex is not a result necessarily of learning, but probably more a result of maturation and biological change. When we talk about learning, we're talking about specific experiences that a person has undergone that have made a change in their behavior. We're also talking about something that serves an adaptive purpose. You see over on the right hand side a picture of Curly, one of the members of the Three Stooges. Surely you've seen images of Curly doing the same thing over and over and over. For example, he runs his head into a buzz saw and says, ow, and then immediately runs his head into the buzz saw again and says, ow, and immediately runs his head into the buzz saw again. We find behavior like this humorous because the person is obviously not learning from experience. Learning, however, is adaptive. Several years ago, I witnessed in the bird bath in my backyard a large bird with something in its beak, and it was dipping this object repeatedly in the bird bath. Upon watching further, I found that what the bird had was a large piece of dog food from our neighbor's yard. The piece of dog food was too large for the bird to eat whole, and so it was dipping the dog food into the water in order to soften it up so that it could eat it. Clearly that's learning that serves an adaptive purpose. Finally, learning is something that occurs by association of events which occur in sequence. A way to illustrate this is for you to think about what letters come before or after other letters of the alphabet. Let me read off some letters of the alphabet for you. For example, what comes after the letter S? That's an easy one, T. What comes before the letter F? What comes after the letter J? What comes before the letter M? What comes after V? What comes before G? If you're like most people, you probably found that it's easier to remember the letters that come after another letter than it is to remember the letter that becomes for, before another letter. This is because we learn by association of events which occur in sequence. If one thing happens, then another thing happens. If you hear the letter F, the next letter is going to be G. It's harder for us to think 
backwards from events. Next slide. In this chapter on learning, we're going to cover three types of learning. Psychologists have traditionally been involved with studying three different branches of learning, sometimes called conditioning. The first is classical conditioning, which we will look at in this lecture. The second is operant conditioning, which we'll look at in a second lecture. And in lecture three, we'll look at observational learning. Next slide. Think about this question for a moment. Doug received injuries in a car accident several months ago and is now healed up physically. However, he's been unable to ride in an automobile again because he experiences so much anxiety when he starts to get into a car. How might Doug's intense anxiety be explained? What could make it better? Surely the anxiety can't be explained in terms of the physical pain because he's healed up physically. So why is it that Doug is still experiencing intense anxiety? Classical conditioning explains the reason that we have anxious responses to situations or emotional responses to situations even when those situations have passed and are already over with. So as we go through looking at classical conditioning, keep this question in mind of how it might possibly explain this scenario that you've just read. Next slide. Classical conditioning or classical learning has to do with automatic responses. Now consider for a moment that we have some responses to our environment that are that we choose. We have other responses to the environment that are automatic. For example, you may choose to get up early and exercise. Or you may choose to open up your textbook and study. These are clearly not automatic responses. They're choices that you make. Other th responses, though, to the environment are automatic. For example, the room is hot. What sort of automatic response do you have to the room being hot? You sweat. That's not a voluntary response. It's automatic. Or an object flies towards your face. What would be your automatic response? Probably to blink or to flinch or to turn your face away from it. You smell the aroma of fresh baked cookies. What might be an automatic response to this stimulus? Probably your stomach growling or maybe your mouth watering. Then think about the automatic response you might have to the stimulus of a loud noise. A loud bang makes most people jump. All these are automatic reflexive responses that we have no control over. Classical conditioning is learning an automatic response to a neutral stimulus that is to a stimulus that you did not normally have that automatic response to before. It will help you to keep in mind and understand classical conditioning if you think about automatic responses. Next slide. Classical conditioning has traditionally been explained in three steps. My guess is you already understand classical conditioning and we're just going to put some technical language on it to help understand exactly, precisely what happens in classical conditioning. But to illustrate how you already understand classical conditioning, let me give you a little story. In my house on Saturday morning, my kids like to come and climb in bed with my wife and I and just goof around and enjoy the relaxed pace of, sat of Saturday morning. If eventually what usually ends up happening is there's a pillow fight. So imagine that we're having a pillow fight, my son and I, my 10-year-old son and I, and I hit him in the head with a pillow, and he flinches. That's a natural response to being hit in the head with a pillow. You could say that being hit by a pillow is an unconditioned stimulus, and getting and flinching as a result is an unconditioned response. So when I hit him in the face with a pillow, he flinches. He closes his eyes and flinches. These are called unconditioned because they're unlearned. You don't have to learn to flinch in response to being hit by a pillow. However, after several trials or instances of hitting my son in the face with a pillow, then I like to just move my elbow and see what happens. Without even hitting him in the face with a pillow, I might move my elbow and guess what he does? You guessed it. 
just the sight of my elbow moving will cause him to flinch. Now why would that be? Moving my elbow is a fairly neutral stimulus. Moving my elbow is not something that normally causes my son to flinch. He doesn't flinch at the dinner table when I move my elbow. He doesn't flinch when we're sitting in the living room when I move my elbow. So why is he now flinching when I move my elbow during this pillow fight? I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, because he knows that the movement of the elbow is a signal that here comes getting hit by the, the pillow. And you're exactly right. So looking at the second row in this diagram on our slide here, the neutral stimulus, the moving of the elbow, if we pair that enough with that unconditioned stimulus of getting hit by a pillow, pretty soon what we find is that the movement of the elbow itself can start to bring on the response of flinching. So in classical conditioning what we're doing is we're pairing a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus that produces an unconditioned response. Pretty soon what we find is that we get the neutral stimulus alone producing the response. So look at the third row and you'll see what I'm talking about. That movement of the elbow alone becomes a conditioned or learned stimulus. It was a neutral stimulus, now it's a learned stimulus and it can produce a response all on its own. I move my elbow and my son flinches. Also notice that in the third row the response is no longer called an unconditioned response because unconditioned means unlearned. It's now called a conditioned response because it's a learned response to the elbow movement. Next slide. One of the more famous names in psychology was Ivan Pavlov who was not even a psychologist he was a Russian physiologist who liked to study dogs' digestive systems. Pavlov would hook up a little tube to the salivary glands of dogs. He would present them with a stimulus of food and measure how much the dogs salivated in response to the food. What Pavlov found, though, was that his results were messed up by what later came to be called classical conditioning. That is, the dogs would be in their cages waiting for their food and when the trainer would come down the hallway to bring the food to the dogs, just the sound of the trainer's footsteps would cause the dog to start to salivate. Pavlov found that this was messing up his results, but being a bright man, he learned that there was, he decided there was something else going on here that was equally worth studying. So he changed to study the psychological aspects of what might have been happening in this situation. What Pavlov did in order to control the situation well is he left the footstep piece out of the equation and instead he substituted a bell. So look at the first row of this slide and you'll see what we saw in the first row of the previous slide an unconditioned or unlearned stimulus producing an unconditioned or unlearned response. In this case it's food producing salivation by the dog. That's a natural reflex, right? That's an automatic response to food, is to salivate. But look at the second row. Instead of the footsteps, Pavlov, to study this accurately, substituted the sound of a bell or a tone. Now a bell or a tone sound is a neutral stimulus. Dogs don't normally drool in response to the sound of a bell, do they? But Pavlov paired up this neutral stimulus with the food to see what would happen. So he began just before the food was presented to present the neutral stimulus of the bell ringing. That is, the bell would ring, the food was presented, the dog would salivate. The bell would ring, the food was presented, the dog would salivate. Guess what happened? Pretty soon, the neutral stimulus of a bell became a conditioned stimulus, that is, a learned stimulus. The bell would ring, and without there being any food present at all, the dog would salivate in response to the bell. So now this response is no longer an unconditioned or unlearned response. It is now a conditioned response. The bell rings, the dog salivates.
the dog has learned a new automatic response to a neutral stimulus. That's the heart of classical conditioning. Next slide. How does classical condition affect you? Is it a part of your life on a daily basis? Well, let's think about some instances in which classical conditioning might affect a person. Could classical conditioning contribute to an alcoholic craving a drink? One of the things that people learn, alcoholics learn, when they go to Alcoholics Anonymous is that they need to find new playmates and new play places. That's the Alcoholics Anonymous lingo to say if you want to stop drinking, you need to not go to the same places you've always gone and stop hanging out with the people that you've always hung out with. Why is this? Classical conditioning can give us a clue as to why this is. If a person drinks with, if let's say if Bob drinks with Tom and Bob decides to stop drinking, but Tom is his drinking buddy, whenever Bob is around Tom, Tom will serve as a conditioned stimulus to bring on cravings for alcohol in Bob. That is, if Bob is usually drinking in the presence of Tom, Tom will be a classically conditioned stimulus. What about this idea of new play places that the Alcoholics Anonymous talks about? Well, if you go to your favorite bar, and that's where you typically drink, and now you want to stop drinking, you probably don't want to go to your favorite bar. The reason being, being in the presence of your favorite bar is going to act as a classically conditioned stimulus to cause you to crave drinking. What about a fear of needles? Some people have an intense fear of needles. Could classical conditioning help us to understand this? Sure it could. To begin with, we need to identify what the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response are. Pain is an unconditioned stimulus that produces an unconditioned response of fear. When we experience pain, we automatically respond with fear. Now what if a child goes to the doctor and sees a needle? That needle is a neutral stimulus until that needle jabs the child and causes pain. Once that needle has jabbed the, the child and caused pain, pretty soon the child becomes classically conditioned to see a needle and fear the needle. Originally the needle caused no fear because it was a neutral stimulus, but when it's pair paired with the pain of an injection, soon the needle itself becomes a conditioned stimulus causing the conditioned response of fear. That's how people become afraid of needles. Next slide. Here are a couple of other examples of how classical conditioning may play a role in a person's life. Sexual arousal, for example. In 1966, a psychologist by the name of Rockman studied sexual arousal and whether it could be classically conditioned. He had male college students look at slides of various objects, including nude female figures. What Rockman did was had males look at a pair of black boots on a slide, which we would consider to be a neutral stimulus. Then he had them look at a picture of a nude pinup. Now what I didn't mention before was the sexual arousal was measured physiologically in these men. We would naturally assume that men might experience sexual arousal as a result of viewing a nude pinup, which would be an unconditioned stimulus. But what Rockman did was paired the pictures of the black boots with the pictures of the pinups. So the men looked at the black boots, they looked at the pinups, they experienced sexual arousal. Looked at the black boots, pinups, arousal, black boots, pinups, arousal, and so forth for about 24 trials. After 24 pairings, Rockman found that the slides of the black boots alone were enough to produce a sexual arousal response. That is, the slide of the black boots had become a conditioned stimulus producing the classically conditioned response of sexual arousal.
Think about how this may affect us in our everyday life when we are surrounded by sexual images in our advertising and on television. A second example of classical conditioning has to do with post-traumatic stress responses. For example, a person who's been in a combat situation has been, been ex exposed to loud noises such as explosions and dangerous situations. Those classically conditioned responses such as jumping to the sounds of loud noises or taking cover under the sound of bombs falling can affect the person when they come back to a non-combat situation, to a civilian situation. So a veteran might be sitting in a restaurant eating a meal and a car going down the street backfires and that sound has become a classically conditioned stimulus over in the combat situation and now the person even though they're not in the combat situation may find themselves jumping under a table as a result of the loud, loud sound of the car backfiring. Another example of classical conditioning. Let's move on to the next slide. Our last slide on classical conditioning involves a quick quiz for you. Which of the following could be classically conditioned? Doing sit-ups, reading a book, squinting in bright light, or starting your car? The clue here is that classical conditioning has to do with automatic responses becoming associated with a neutral stimulus. And the only one here that could be an automatic response would be squinting in bright light. Doing sit-ups, reading a book, and starting your car are all voluntary actions. End of slide.